No, it was very ironic. I was a nurse and I died on the anniversary of Florence Nightingale's death. <laughs> very appropriate. I, I started out in the arts, but in my second year, I transferred to the nursing program at Toronto General Hospital. <laughs> I graduated from there in 1925, and I spent the next eight years specialising in operating room nursing. You know, it's funny. I really don't know why I chose nursing. But of course, in those days, there weren't many choices for young women. There was nursing and there was teaching. <laughs> and I definitely was not going to be a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, jobs for nurses were rather scarce in those days. Most, when they graduated, went into private nursing. But I was lucky. I found one of those scarce hospital jobs. But I wouldn't have missed the war for anything. <laughs> After war was declared in 39, I decided to enlist. Well, I guess you could say the military was in my blood. Well, I headed up a contingent of nursing sisters, as we were called. They had sailed from Canada to England in September of 1939 as part of the Royal Canadian Medical Corps. Now, I didn't serve at the front. Well, that might surprise you. You may envision, envision nurses at the front, just or just behind the lines, working. But you know, there were many of us in Britain. They had what they called Canadian General Hospitals. And I was at Canadian General Hospital number 15. It was at a place in Bramshot, near London. <laughs> yes, listen to this. It's a little story they wrote that gives you a little facet of my character. Just for a moment, we will dwell on the sterner side of Matron's disposition. She was always a great believer in protecting the reputation of the sisters. Consequently, rules were laid down accordingly. One of these rules was that no officer at any time should call for a sister at her hut, her private quarters but could visit her in the mess hall, which was a public gathering spot. On this particular occasion, three brave, stalwart-looking officers attempted to call for three sisters living in the same hut as matron. There is little doubt they confused hut number four with the sisters' mess. At any rate, somewhere in the vicinity of the doorstep, they encountered the matron, <laughs> me. And what happened there was truly quite spectacular. <laughs> I couldn't help but think if that was a sample of what our Canadian officers would do in enemy action, we have every reason to feel nervous. <laughs> Almost immediately, they were in full retreats. And in less than five minutes, they had taken up new positions on the second line of defence, this being the sidewalk, still resisting, but still losing. <laughs> the reason I tell you this story is to remind us all that when our matron said no, she meant no. Jenny, you've never heard of me, didn't make a name for myself or marry someone rich or have children that went on to become someone important. 
No one comes here to visit my grave. <clears throat> I was born in Ingersoll, Ontario in 1872. We moved around a bit, first to Smith Township, to Duro, and then eventually to Peterborough. Dad and Mom were like a lot of people, just trying to get a foothold in life. I got a job, a respectable one for a young woman. I was a maid in the house of John Cummings and his wife Mary. I bet that sounds pretty fancy to you, but maids were really common back then. If you could afford the help and it didn't cost all that much, it made life a lot easier on the lady of the house. I worked six days a week and I was good at my job. I couldn't continue in the employ of Mr. and Mrs. Cummings. I had to be let go, lest I bring shame upon their household. You see, about the same time Mrs. Cummings was with child, so was I. The father was, well, he, well, I cannot say. I'm not supposed to say anything. Anyway, me with child, well, that wouldn't do, so I was let go. Such a cruel trick of nature. My little Georgie, born unto the wrong woman. George was born in June 1901, and by that fall, I was in a bad way. No husband, no job, and an infant to care for. I'd become the kind of woman people whispered about. In November, I was arrested for vagrancy, which really meant I was arrested for the crime of being poor and having sex outside of marriage. I and my baby were sentenced to six months in the Peterborough jail. Jail's no place for a child. He should have been in a nursery. He was seven months old. The doctor said he was sickly from the beginning, that he never really stood a chance, but I know better. Had I been able to provide for him, or if his father had... After my sentence had been served, Maggie and her husband took me in for a while, but I'd lost all faith in this life. Without George, younger version of me. Goodness, we are both the same person. Is that what I will look like when I'm old? How old are you, by the way? Oh, well, I'm dead. <laughs> I died at 96 in 1957. Gracious. Wait, and these people here, are they? But they came to hear about the life and artistic career of Catherine Wallace. But I knew from an early age I wanted to become an artist. And then Ada and I, oh, I forgot. Mother and father even built me a little studio where I could paint. And then Ada and I took a magical trip to Scotland where we studied at the Edinburgh School of Art. I became a copyist, Ada studied wood carving, oh, and I even had work displayed at the National Gallery. But then, Mother got ill, and we were called home. She died, and then for seven long years, I looked after Father until he passed away not so long ago. Change will come about sooner than you think. <laughs> I can't wait. Please, tell me about your life as an artist. But I think it was our family friend, Anne Langton, who said to me that if I wished to attain my dream, I needed to leave Canada. So, Ada and I went to London, UK, where we studied at the School of Art, of South Kensington School of Art and Design. I did so well that my teachers encouraged me to take up sculpting as a profession. And I won my first award. <laughs> and I was encouraged to go to Paris. And Oscar Waldman helped me get works exhibited at the Spring Salon of the Artistes Francaise. What materials were you working in then? Oh, um, stone and marble and bronze. Did you have any sh 
pieces shown in Canada? Oh, no, no, no. We are talking about the 1890s, when Canada was not exactly a hotbed of artistic endeavour, <laughs> especially for women. <laughs> no, my work was exhibited in Great Britain and Europe, but you know, it was always my wish to be recognised here at home. I wish I could see some of your sculptures, so I know how much work I have ahead of me. I'm getting quite exhausted just thinking about it all. Well, I happen to have a few photographs here that I was going to show the audience, but I'll show you first. This is Mercury. I did that? No, 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 you haven't done it yet. <laughs> but you're going to. That's right, of course. I'm inspired. I could see myself creating this. Where is it now? Oh my goodness, I have so many questions. It was shipped to Toronto for the Ontario Museum agreed to buy it. But when it was received, the curator mistakenly thought it was dirty plaster and ordered it to be repainted over. <coughs> I physically had to go to the museum and move, remove the paint. Huh, I lodged a complaint, but it wasn't taken seriously. One of the sculptures I am most proud of and that has an interesting story is La Lutte pour la Vie. I know the word V means life, but what is loot? Oh, that's right. We didn't do very well in French in school, did we? <laughs> Something else you're going to have to learn. <laughs> the title is The Struggle for Life. More challenges ahead. But what is the story? The story is about a Russian woman who saves her baby from a vicious wolf. And I had difficulty finding just woman who would pose as a model holding tight her baby over her shoulder. I was extremely pleased with that sculpture. It became a kind of symbol of the forces between good and evil. It was that sculpture that established me at the highest level of the Society des Beaux-Arts in Paris. <laughs>